to give you an introduction to what virtual reality is, um, virtual reality is a growing field in technology. Basically, you, uh, it's a headset that you put onto, onto your head with your uh, mobile phone or for PC, it's just a built-in headset, and it allows you to experience um, mobile or browsing in a different manner. Um, some active companies in this field include Oculus, Samsung, Sony, and HTC. And recently, there's been heavily a large amount of investment in virtual reality. Um, for example, in 2014, Facebook um, acquired Oculus after a $2 billion valuation. And in f another huge VR company, Magic Leap, uh, raised $1.4 billion for their uh, business segment. So to give you a brief market analysis from um, uh, super, da super data for this uh, for virtual reality market, uh, the trend for it is supposed to explode in the next coming years. Um, more so, uh, hardware, uh, sorry, the consumer software services is exploding, and even the hardware has a pretty good growth pattern over the next couple of years. So the idea for our virtual reality keyboard started when we were just messing around with the Google Cardboard headset. We put the headset on top of our head, and we noticed, hey, it's really hard to navigate in this environment. If we wanted to uh, input text into the headset, we had to take the headset off, type into our, um, type into our mobile phone to look at a different video and then put it back on. Um, we felt that this kind of ruined the experience for virtual reality. So our motivation, um, we believe that not only will VR just be a niche gaming product, we believe in the future that everyone will be using virtual reality in their, in their, in their lives. Um, but it's, we also believe it's going to expand to other applications. So for example, um, we feel in the future that it could expand to coding in VR. You can, uh, you can code in your virtual reality headset and also see the environment in the, in the same screen. Um, the ability to search the web and also word processing um, activities. So to give you a problem definition for our project, um, right now in virtual reality there's no standard method of typing. Um, due to, of course, you can't see where your hands are as seen in the picture there. Um, and other methods for, um, for typing are inherently slow and impedes the user's experience. Uh, so to give you an example of some of the methods, uh, there's drum typing where you have the keyboard in front of you and you have controllers and you can select characters by, in a drumming manner. Um, gaze method where you look in the VR headset and you kind of select by tapping the side of your head to select the letter that you want. And also another company that's uh, coming up with different type of methods, Tap With Us, where you have a strap on your hand and you have to tap on the surface to get the letters that you want. Now, for example, that one has, for VR, it's not very um, friendly because you have to have a surface beside you at the whole, at the whole time. And if you want to look around, you kind of have to move your hand around. So, so the next slide. So for our project, for our customer requirements, we specified that they would need to access all characters on the QWERTY keyboard. Um, would have to be compatible with different phones, such as um, uh, Apple phones or an Android phone. Um, it would have to be mobile, cost effective, and intuitive to use. With that, I'll hand it over to Justin. Thank you, Ryan. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about our proposed design, what we actually plan to do. So what our idea was, was to have two controllers, four buttons on each hand, and a joystick, and basically be able to duplicate a QWERTY keyboard onto this controller. So the basic theory behind it is to have a certain amount of buttons or a certain amount of inputs, uh, transfer it to a microcomputer where the microcomputer would take the input, translate it into the correct HID output, and then send it to the phone through Bluetooth or some type of wireless device. So the microcomputer is probably the most important part of our project to make sure that it uh, functions the way we want it to. So the requirements of the microcomputer are that, one, it is a small device capable of reading various inputs. It has to be small because in our controller, it's not very big, so we want it to fit inside. That size is a pretty important requirement. Second, it has to be, have Bluetooth functionality because that's how we were planning on communicating to the device. And thirdly, it has to be compatible with small batteries for mobile usage. It doesn't make sense to have this thing plugged in all the time because what's the point if it has to be plugged in? So here's the uh, computer options that we had. At first, we went with the Arduino, just because that's the more, most popular one. It's a very simple input to output system. The problem with this was that it didn't have enough processing power that, to run the programs that we wanted to run, because it, we ended up using a program that you actually needed to load onto the system, and we just, the Arduino was not capable. So we went over to the Raspberry Pi. The one that we tried more so was the Raspberry Pi Zero, that one is basically a Linux computer in this really small factor. Um, it's perfect for our application. The one thing that it does not have, though, is built-in Bluetooth. 
And that was a big problem for us because if you, without the built-in Bluetooth, you would need some type of external attachment to get the Bluetooth to work. And that takes up space, and again, space is a big part of a project because we want it to fit inside. So the last one we went with was the chip. The chip is the, uh, the, what we actually used. It has built-in Bluetooth, so it's perfect for our application. It runs Debian, just a version of Linux, so we can easily program onto it, run the programs right off of it, and you would have no problems with it. It was perfect for our application. All right, so I'll go over the hardware of the chip. Um, <clears throat> so as Justin said, our chip runs on a Linux operating system um, so that we can directly program our scripts onto it. Um, we, it also has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, Bluetooth capabilities. It's one gigahertz processor, four gigs of st storage, and 512 megs of uh, RAM. So for the dimensions, uh, the chip is fairly uh, compact, six by three by one centimeter and only weighs 30 grams. Uh, Built-in GPIO pins for prototyping, and the most significant thing for our, um, for our controller is that it has a built-in power management system, so we don't have to worry about the battery frying our circuit board. And also, it can easily connect to a LiPo battery for usage. Uh, so for the connections to the pin, we use 12 out of the 40 pins for, um, for like our buttons on the controller and also for our analog to digital converter. Um, two pins were dedicated to the on-off switch, and we also had two pins for our ground and power planes. Um, as you can see here, we have our ground and power planes. Um, we originally had a, a breadboard inside of our controller, but it took, uh, took up too much space, so we just hard soldered all of our components. So that's basically the hardware of the chip. I'll talk a little bit about the software. So what, how do you actually get this thing to work? When you get the chip, it originally starts as with no operating system on it. So to get it started, you gotta flash the chip, basically meaning to load the operating system. Uh, it has its own little um, website that you can flash it onto, so as long as you have it plugged in the computer, you go to the website, it'll kind of do it for you. The next thing you have to do is enable the Wi-Fi and SPI communications, and that basically allowed us to use the internet and also communicate to the joystick. And then download necessary components through Linux. If you guys are familiar with Linux, I'm sure you would know that you can basically do everything through the terminal, so you just download what you need. And the last thing was, since the chip has Linux on it, you can easily use Git. Um, if you know what Git is, you can program on your own computers at home, load it onto the repository, and pull the repository so you don't actually program directly onto it. So I'll quickly talk about Bluetooth configuration. This is an important part of our project because without the Bluetooth, there is no end product. So this is quite important to know. The first thing you need to do is install the up and update the BlueZ5 stack. BlueZ5 stack is basically the Bluetooth protocol for Linux. So once you do that, personalize the Bluetooth server with the chip's MAC address, because each chip has a unique address. So you have to let the script know that this is the address so it can communicate. And then lastly, the device needs to be connected to the, um, needs to be configured to connect upon the first connection. So now that you have the Bluetooth connected, there's an, uh, in total we run three different scripts. But there's one BDK underscore server. That, what that does is it establishes a desktop bus communication, basically lets the script that we're about to use talk to the inputs that we put into it. And now that you have the, the server uh, connection started, that's ready to go, the script that actually reads the inputs is not started yet. So how do you do that? You do one full rotation to the left, one full rotation to the right. Um, you can see in the video, we try to take it, but um, it's kind of a little laggy here. But what I do is make one full rotation to the left and one full rotation to the right. And that kind of tells the computer, hey, I made this sequence. Well, chances are you're not going to make the sequence if, you're not know, if you don't know what you're doing. So it tells the computer, hey, we made the sequence. We're ready to start using it. So now that that's all the software behind it, now we to talk about the character mapping, how we actually got the entire query keyboard and all its functionalities onto these four uh, buttons. So first thing, the, the joystick is really important to know. There's five uh, zones in the joystick. In the middle, is the call, we call it the dead zone at the north, east, south, and west. And basically, each location will determine which character it outputs. So the actual uh, keyboard locations and letter locations are based on frequency of letter use. So we made the most frequently used letters of the alphabet the ones where you didn't need to use the joystick at all because it's easiest to just click a button and not have to use the joystick. So basically, an example of that is on the next slide. Yeah, on this table, it basically shows you all the, the entire layout that we had. So for example, the A is over here in the left pinky. Um, the A is a really commonly used character in the alphabet. And it also, if you knew the, knew the QWERTY keyboard, it'd be located where the pinky is on the left. So that, hence, that's why it's on the left-hand pinky. 
And as you move down, you can kind of see like the locations. We use AESET and IOP as the home keys because, again, those are the most frequently used letters. So that's why we base it on this way. And it also resembles a credit keyboard because um, we didn't just put like on the Query keyboard, you know, you know the L's, like, you know the P's all the way in the far right hand side, so it wouldn't make sense to put the P on the left hand uh, here. So that's the way we went with these locations. So I'll just give you a quick example of how you to get, so that's how you would get the characters in the dead zone. But if you wanted to get a character in not the dead zone, like let's say the letter R, for example. And so how you do that is you click the button for the T, so the left index finger, and then you'd use the joystick and push it to the right, and that would give you an R. So with these uh, characters, um, sorry, can you just quickly go back? So we split up the keyboard into four different quadrants here, the lowercase, uppercase, numbers, and arrows function. So basically what that means is, depending on which quadrant you're in, you'd have different outputs depending on the button. So even if, if you're in the upper alphabet quadrant and you clicked the um, left index, for example, you'd get an uppercase T. If you were in the lowercase alphabet and you click the, click the left index, you get a lowercase T. So this is kind of demonstrated over here how you would get to the different quadrant sets. Uh, to actually do it, you just simply click down on the joystick and move in one of the directions, and those would get you to the different quadrants. So with the, now that you know how to do the character outputs, let's say you want functions on the keyboard that's not a character, aka spaces, enters, shifts, controls, etc. cetera. Um, how you do that is all through the joystick. So the first thing that you need to know is we basically split it up into flick cycles, half rotations, and full rotation cycles. What that means is just different, um, met, like different actions to use on the joystick. So if you simply flick the joystick upwards, you would get a space. If you flicked it to the left, you would get a tab. Um, this is kind of based on frequency of use again, because flicking to the top, we realized, is the easiest to do just because I guess it felt the most, most natural. It's just the easiest overall to do. And hence, that's why the space is there, because it's the most commonly used letter, or most commonly used non-typable character in the, in the keyboard. The next one. So here, let's talk about the half rotation cycles, what these are. Things that are somewhat common, but not as common as the other ones. So let's say you want to get a, a backspace, for example. How you do that is you'd go from the dead zone right in the middle, go to the north, and then swing around to the bottom of the south one. And if you let go of the joystick, it'll automatically click back into the dead zone. So that would be how you get its backspace. And it is kind of confusing to note at first, but once you get to use it a couple times, it becomes quite inherent to use. It's, like I've used it for probably, it took me about two hours to remember all this stuff. So if you have like a couple hours on your hands, it's definitely something that anyone could learn. The last rotation that we have is the four rotation cycles. These are characters that aren't ne used nearly as much. So the alt, for example, isn't used often. The meta character, which is like the Windows home key, isn't really used all too often. So that's why those characters are there. Here's a quick look at me actually using some of these things. So right now, the video shows, I'm actually tabbing through the options at the top. And then I'll get down to the characters here. And I'll enter some spaces, just like that. And I'll enter some enter signs. So I'm going down. And I'm going to do backspace a couple times. Now I'm going to do a shift to get a capital T, and another shift to get a capital E. And I'm going to do a couple of deletes so you can see me deleting the words going forward. So just like a normal keyboard, it works just like that. And here's, OK, so once we actually got this thing working, and typing characters working the way we wanted to, we wanted to make some improvements upon it, what we could do to possibly make it a little more user friendly, a little more inherent to use. So what we did was something called the character cursor preview. It's basically a software to allow the user to see the character they're about to output before they actually output it. So what I mean by this is, if I hold the button, and it'll flash a character. So it'll tell me, hey, this is the character that's about to be pressed. And now if I move the joystick in each of the directions, it'll tell me which characters are around it. So it's kind of a way to, for the user to know which characters they're about to press or before they actually do it. And it, we, I noticed that it's actually really helpful because it reduces the learning curve by a lot. The next thing we wanted to implement after the character cursor was something called cascading typing, which is basically the ability for the user to change the output by pressing a new button. So on a keyboard, if you're, let's say you're pressing A, and then you switch over to the S, the S will be the new one typed. So that's, the, that's where we got the idea from. If I hold the left, left index, for example, and then I realize that's not the character that I want, I can simply click the left middle button, and it'll switch over to the left middle as a new button, and it won't sense the left index at all. It'll just think that the left middle is the button that's pressed. Okay, and that is all for that. All right, so I'll briefly discuss the enclosure that we created for our um, 
for our controller. So some of the main design constraints we had to uh, consider when we were making the enclosure were the large internal components. So the chip, the LiPo battery, and also the analog joystick. Um, in addition, um, we had to uh, account for varied hand sizes and also accessibility to internal components. Now one of the major things which was difficult to account for was uh, the fact that we were using all five digits on the hand for different inputs. Because um, it, it, it makes the hand placement on the controller extremely difficult. So just to give you an idea of our prototype process, um, and you see in the le left figure right here, um, we started with a very basic prototype just to see if all the components inside would fit in that type of enclosure. And, and then we would um, also see how the hand would fit around that. So once we figured, hey, this is a good, air or good size range, we tried to create a, a 3D printed model that's more uh, curvy and could conform around one's hand. So what we did here is we had a, uh, we had the buttons placed uh, on one side of the uh, enclosure and then the analog stick as seen there. And one of the uh, lessons learned here is that um, when we created that enclosure, with the buttons not on the opposite side of the analog stick, it was very hard to press onto the buttons. So we had to basically scrap that idea and put the buttons on the opposing side of the analog stick. So our final design can seen at the very uh, far end there was the analog stick and the buttons on the opposing side. So here's more of a cross-section of our final enclosure design. Um, some of the uh, design components of our enclosure is that we included a snap-fit lid uh, so that you can put the two halves together and snap, snap in place, a analog stick port, a supports for the analog stick, and also slots for finger straps so your hands can uh, hold on to the controller nicely. And here's a kind of a poor picture of our prototype, but you can see we have an analog stick up there and the two buttons below. Uh, so t for testing verification, since this is like more of a software design project, it wasn't very too much um, verification we had to do. All we had to do was just make sure that our, um, our um, controllers could connect to multiple different types of phones, so like Android and, and Apple phones, and also that the software, were, um, the correct key mapping scheme that we had on paper matched what was outputted in, in the software. For cost analysis of our of our pro project. Um, each controller cost, costed $62. Um, relatively cheap for, for a prototype. Um, we, can, uh, we can, if we were to mass produce it, we could reduce the cost significantly for each controller. In conclusion, we recreated a keyboard with character inputs compatible with Android and iOS phones, mobile, lightweight, and also cost effective. For further work, we we'll probably want to go forth with a PCP design to reduce cost and also size. Um, predictive text to increase the typing speed for the user. Um, create a typing application to overcome the learning curve of our product. Improved ergonomic design and also mouse fun functionality in our controller. Thank you, and do you guys have any questions? Virtual reality itself? No, the requirement for this keyboard. Um, we didn't really do too too much research into how big the market was for the keyboards itself because usually when you buy like if you buy like a high end system, they come with controllers and they have their little typing method. But our our thing is more so meant for like a twenty dollar generic hard uh, virtual reality headset. You can go to Best Buy and buy one of those Google Cardboard types of things for like twenty five dollars, twenty dollars. So our Products more so meant for people with like that, whereas like they don't have a specific built-in method, and they would use something like ours to work around having to take it off every single time, just type something in. Yeah. Okay. Then, so Dr. Ben. In total, or like, like based on sorry, wait, what's? Um, if you're really good at it, there like you could. There's no, like no lag between the two. Like r literally, as soon as I click the button here, it'll show up on the phone over there. There's no lag between it. But uh, the way that we set it up is there's something called the character cursor mode, which, as I said, is like the preview mode. So 
what that does is it kind of like lags like a 0.5 seconds, just so it kind of lets the user see which character they're about to output before it goes back. But realistically, if you were to put in the pro mode where there's no cursor input at all, it would be if like there's no lag between the two. Mm -hmm. And it can actually type out every character on the keyboard. Like I've done it on my phone. It's typed out every character on it. Uh, it was 3D printed. Yeah, so we 3D printed the enclosure, drilled the holes in it ourselves, put the battery, put the buttons in, soldered everything ourselves, and yeah, we created the entire prototype. All right. Well, yep. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, guys.